the reason why digital only fashion is still pretty niche is we don't have enough spaces in the digital world to show it off, right? The reason why people want to buy beautiful clothes is because they have places to go. And so I think as we have more and more avenues in the digital space to flex, quote unquote, we'll, we'll start seeing kind of a huge, um, you know, rise in people just wanting to have looks for their digital persona, but we're not there yet. Avery, happy Friday. Happy Gen C day. We are doing the things here. I'm so excited to talk to you. We have a bit of a special episode in the sense that uh, we were able to do a record with Nelly Mensa from LVMH early this week that I was able to do. You were traveling. Really fascinating conversation all about, frankly, just how LVMH has been in this game for so many years compared to most other brands. We, we kind of touched on the fact that like, you know, the big moment that like Taco Bell had when they did an NFT and then no one's ever heard from Taco Bell again, compared <laughs> yes. to the fact that like Sephora and Louis Vuitton and all the wine brands and all the different areas of, of LVMH that are exploring emerging tech that they just keep going in. And I think it's a fascinating conversation for our audience. I think so too, especially coming off of, I know they just did some really cool stuff at Paris NFT week. So LVMH continues to double down in that space, continue to speak specifically about NFTs. So yay. And Nelly is amazing and has a really good perspective of sort of the global work and, and so her central function, um, as well as being deep on some of the brand projects like the trunks and whatnot. Absolutely. But first I wanted to, you know, while we have you get some, some thoughts and some interesting stories that have been happening. These are there's kind of a, a, a big macro that I'm, I, I guess I want to think about with you. In the last couple of weeks, some things have bubbled up that I think are starting to sort of show some pushing of the seams in the fabric of our media world. So, for example, Complex just got sold. Vice stopped publishing on Vice.com. They're really only going to be a content studio working with other publishers. And it made me wonder this question I don't want to throw to you, which is a big one, which is like, is top of the funnel advertising dead? And I say that because I was listening to an interview on the rebooting, shout out to Brian Morrissey, where he was talking with Neil Vogel from Dot Dash. They have like 40 different titles. And Neil was sort of saying, we have to stop thinking that premium publisher advertising is the way to build media businesses. We have to look at alternative revenue streams. And it made me just wonder, like that idea that, you know, it used to be, oh, I'm going to the New York Times or I'm going to Sports Illustrated to buy a very like involved audience. You can now get to them in so many other ways. And I think that's kind of what we're seeing with Vice and Complex. And so I guess I just wanted to get your thoughts as someone who's deep into the ad world. How are you thinking about this just reimagination of media and where audiences happen to be and how they're getting their news and information? That is a great and super loaded question, Sam. I, I'll, I'll quote our friend Ari, who spent many years working at Vice as the chief of staff there. And she said she's sad but not surprised to see this happen to Vice. And that perfectly encapsulated how I felt about this as well. I think Vice is emblematic of sort of the, that early 2000s cool publisher. They had a, the amazing office. And they threw these great parties and that like it was this sort of curation, this in the know, in the scene, great sort of content, great, you know, debatably great journalism, but some people thought it was great. Um, and, you know, they also had a really strong advertising business. And there was a whole host of publishers in that era, whether you're thinking about a pure wow or the infatuation or refinery 29, many of them sort of, uh, got purchased by larger holding groups who delivered sort of economies of scale. And I think over the last 10 years, we've just seen that advertising business really shrink. Um, and I think the New York times is unique because the New York times is the New York times. And there's sort of only one of them, but their advertising business is also facing significant challenges, not to the point where it's not a business line anymore for them, but even the New York times is having a hard time. And what those sort of lifestyle publishers, I think were responsible for curating interesting information and experiences. And the first thing that kind of hit them was programmatic advertising, this idea that, oh, like, I don't need to call up Jane from this publisher and put in my buy. I can just do it myself online or have my media buyer do it online. And that was like chip one. I think the chip two was the rise of social media and the fact that anyone can be a content creator. You can be a content creator. I can be a content creator. Jane, who used to work at the publisher, can be a content creator. A brand can be a content creator. And that, you know, curation of information 
doesn't need to come only from a specific group. Like if you have an interesting point of view, anyone can build their audience. And brands caught on to that too. And they're like, wait, instead of paying this publisher to reach these people, I can build my own direct relationship with my consumers for putting out mm. great content myself. And I think probably the best example of that is Red Bull, where Red Bull really created this new media business um, that was all about adventure content. And they, of course, have done a lot in sports and their F1 team and whatnot. But they were the the sort of strongest example of the ability to build your own audience versus sort of buying it from a publisher. And, you know, I think over the last few years, that's all, then came TikTok. And then it was just like, shit, it's over. Um, right, we're done. Because TikTok, you don't even need to have a name. It's actually about the content itself, not the handle. Like you can have millions of followers. Some of the biggest publishers in the world have tons of followers. And I see their reels on Instagram or TikTok and they're getting like a thousand views. Like the content itself has to be relevant. You can also have right. someone who has zero followers and, you know, post something and, and it goes viral. It's, you know, a personal anecdote. I tell my husband this all the time. I was like, you should just post this on TikTok. And like, if it's good, it's going to work. And he's like, oh, nobody knows my new business handle or whatever. And it got like 20,000 impressions. And he was like, this is insane. I'm like, yeah, I know it is. <laughs> yeah. So I think that the TikTok vacation of, of all formats of social media has also contributed to this. It's not necessarily needed to go through a publisher because you want to build it yourself. You can create your own relevant content. You can create a more, a more direct relationship with consumers. Of course, it's still intermediated through the social platforms, which is something you and I have talked about um, ad nauseum as well. And this is the trend today, but the trend a few years ago was based on followers. And in the future, it might be different, but all I can speak about is like where it is today. With that said, I actually think top of the funnel advertising is very much still in vogue and I think it very much still works. I just don't think it's a banner ad on a website. I mean, people are spending less time on websites. Those banner ads become less and less effective every moment. But I think that the idea of top of funnel still really matters. You know, I'm a big believer in podcast advertising. I'm a big believer mm -hmm. in experiential advertising. I'm a big believer in Super Bowl ads. And I think all of those are top of the funnel. You don't you know, listen to a podcast and go click to buy right away um, after hearing it. But that enhances credibility, especially host read ads, I think enhance that a lot. So I'm seeing publishers shift into that. They're doing cool events. I can speak to our publishing house gallery media group and their business, uh, you know, a decade ago was very much based on, you know, advertorials and, and ad units on the site. Now it's all based on social content for brands, experiences. We're doing something really cool at South by, and they've just been really, Ryan Harwood, who runs that team has been really smart and evolving. Like they have handles like at cocktails and at ball players that, you know, have viral hits all the time. And they've shifted their model to kind of meet consumers where they are. Um, and I think some other publishers weren't able to do that in the same way because it has changed a ton. And I'll go on the record by saying, I think publisher media can still really work when it's authentic. Mm -hmm. And when that authority has credibility with a certain group of people. Um, Vogue has done a nice job kind of hanging on to this through things like integration of their fashion shows and whatnot. And it has to be authentic and unique. It can't just be sort of standard ads. But I, I too am sad, but not surprised to see this unfolding. I, I think just to jump on what you're saying, I think there's two two things there that are really important, which is still good content matters. And I think that there's, you know, what we saw with Sports Illustrated, frankly, was they stopped making good content and they stopped being relevant and they stopped innovating as a brand. And so it let other folks, whether it's The Athletic or it's Joe, who just comments on sports on TikTok, be able to be successful. So I think part of just always innovating, always optimizing, always thinking about the next. Also, the idea of how do you reimagine product placement in a world where creators and, and brand leaders are themselves the, the, the funnel for this information? But there's nothing wrong with figuring out native ways. You just don't want it to be overly sort of cheesy. You know, you have to be able to integrate well. And even the Super Bowl, frankly, every one of those commercials is product placement because people go to watch the commercials, right? Like the whole show is commercial and a game at the same time. Not one of them outweighs another. Uh, so thinking about that, I think is really important. I was also really shocked when I was looking at the complex stuff about part of when Complex got sold, they said it's because their event business also isn't doing as well as they thought. The narrative of events are booming, whatever. It still has to be strategically well done. We still have to it budget still them to correctly. It still has to be a great event. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I think the important part is here, everything still works, but it has to be good. Events right. work if they're good. Content works if it's good. Publishers work if it's good. And, you know, I think a lot of times people just think like the macro industry sucks or is amazing. And they're like, there's pros Correct. and cons to anything. 
we see a ton of events businesses exploding. We see a ton crumbling. Like it all depends on how you execute it. One of the things that, that's been so interesting to see is when you look at like Meta's earnings and Meta's earnings did great. And they, you know, which which was partly because when this sort of conversation around the death of the cookie and how that was going to affect programmatic went away, like they were like, oh, actually we use AI to supercharge audience understanding. And it actually now is delivering even better results through this. So it's so even to that point, it's not like programmatic was bad. It's that you just have to think more creatively over and over and over. How do you get your ad in, in, in front of the right people in the right way at the right time and understanding your audiences and then creative relevance is obviously key. Um, the other thing I heard you say is that we are open for business. Brands, come on. We will read your ad. We're happy to do it. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> Gen Z is looking to pack our bags. For the right ones, of course. And you have to screen that and make sure it's like an authentic fit, right? Like it's not like a teeth whitening brand. It's something that's focused on innovation. I, and I think that's another like essential part of it that is key to authenticity and key to successful media placements is it has to be like the right context. Yeah. Avery, the second thing I want to get your take on is uh, last week we saw two very polarizing things happen, which were the same story. Mm -hmm. One was, you know, Google's Gemini LLM got sort of critiqued because it was like overly woke, quote unquote, and everything from how it was describing things in its text to showing founding fathers being not the race of our founding fathers. And people had a field day with that. Similarly, on Gab, which is kind of a right wing social network, there were LLMs that were introduced where with characters that were like denying the Holocaust or that you could have a conversation directly with Hitler. And so people are utilizing this technology in ways that have become very, very politicized. And to me, it just sort of opened that door that we, we've talked about many times. So just like the idea of open systems versus very closed systems and being able to get like very efficient uses of these media, how brands have to be super careful because I do think that small decisions, especially in a viral world world where everyone like is part of this anger algorithm, they are going to rip you apart if you're not playing the game. And I just wanted to sort of think about it through the lens of, is this why brands are still being very shy about bringing true gen, I, gen AI projects public? Because they know that they still cannot control the outcomes. If Google can't do it, like why does, you know, a soda brand think they can? What are your thoughts on it? It's, um, it's a good question. And one that I think people are being careful because they see this type of thing. I do think that's somewhat of like, it's people are provoking the AI to ask these questions Absolutely. with the intention of creating sensationalist media out of it. And Google knows that and companies know that. That's a huge concern for a lot of our clients and why, you know, even we've talked about doing virtual chatbots for X, Y, or Z and like giving them very clear parameters to make sure we don't do anything, you know, that's going to create uh, a brand safety challenge or concern for the the business. And I think that that is a risk because Google's also put in these parameters. But if you're intentional about provoking it the right way, like you can get it to say something that um, that isn't politically correct. I think it's also important, though, to note that most of these companies are adding disclaimers very clearly. I see that in OpenAI. I see that in Google. I see that in Anthropics to say like some of this information is generated by AI might not be 100% accurate and whatnot. I think those disclaimers matter. But that doesn't it doesn't shock me either because that's such like the obvious thing of human behavior. Of course, that's going to happen. Yeah. I, I heard someone refer to this. I don't remember who or else I would cite it, but that we're sort of like at the 1996 version of web pages right now. Yeah. Like if, if we looked at them then, we'd be like, those are so terrible and rudimentary and they'd have like blink tags all over them. And now we look at a web, web page and it's elegant. I think we do think this stuff is moving so fast that we're over promising where where it should be today, as opposed to like, this is still super new technology, a lot of which is untested. So brands just should take caution because I do think you and I interview people every single week who say, of course, us brand are playing in Gen AI, but no one's really telling us how they're doing it effectively or how it's today affecting business outcomes. I think they're all in that yeah. experimental phase. But Sam, let's let's reflect back to what you just said about Meta and their incredible earnings. Their employee um, count is way down <laughs> and their earnings are looking great. Yes. And, you know, yeah. I saw plenty of commentary on that as well, as I'm sure you did. But, what, but Avery, you made this point. Uh, you made this point a couple of months ago, which I think was so accurate, which was that whether you're Google or you're Meta in the ad business, they've been applying artificial intelligence yes. for years. So that's not... We used to call it machine learning, right, exactly, but it's exactly. the same thing. So, but I think that's a great point, which is like, for them, this is still now years into the arc, whereas a brand who's saying, oh, I'm a soda brand. Right. 
you're not years into the you're not ready you're yet. just starting off and also they don't have the same level of data that um that a meta or a google do keep in mind like cpgs like yeah you have your sales numbers and you have historical ads and you know you have some consumer surveys but it's not like the just troves of data that these tech companies have i you know i think we were talking about this recently in um, a smaller forum but like amazon can't even give you like the full amount of, they know everything you're going to buy. Like it would just scare people right, exactly. how much they know. <laughs> and so they're like kind of drip feeding us right. like little bit, little bit. How did you know I was thinking about getting a new AirPod cleaner? <laughs> oh, somehow it read my mind. Yeah. Um, so I think that that's uh, honestly, Sam, a, a really important point though, is actually uh, all across Silicon Valley, we're seeing the tech layoffs continue in a quieter fashion. Earnings are going up. That is not typical that headcount goes down and, you know, revenue goes up. Correct. And I think we're starting to see that happen. And I, it's a trend that I think we'll continue seeing over the next little bit here. Yeah. And then I guess for the final story, I mean, it's even better when your workforce are just children doing it on your behalf, aka there's a child labor lawsuit happening uh, with Roblox right now, which I think is a little bit ridiculous, frankly. But it does come in the news that we saw last week that that Roblox creators earned $740 million last year, which I was like, mm -hmm. talk about a robust creator economy. Roblox is such a good one. And again, I, I keep thinking about how how many people are still not thinking about their strategy around gaming. And I'm sure you have to have this conversation every single day with, with uh, brands and internally. Was there any any surprises in the fact that they minted so much money for creators? No, I, I've been seeing that for a while. And um, it's really interesting because it's a lot of like young creators, like quite young creators, which is, is part of the the rub that you just mentioned. Some of these kids are making a fortune on um, what they're building in Roblox and they're building communities and, you know, they're selling virtual items and their UGC stuff. So it, it's fascinating to see. And Roblox is very supportive of the creator economy. This, you know, and, and they also have very clear guidance around children, around marketing to children and, um, Etc. So they've taken a really firm stance on being super, you know, above the letter of the law when it comes to marketing for kids. But this is a big challenge because uh, Roblox is a platform, right? Like they're not building these experiences themselves. It's all, you know, created by the users. And if the users are young, how does that exactly work? So not a lawyer. We'll have to see how that whole thing kind of pans out. But uh, I am excited to see the continuing growth of the Roblox creator economy. And I feel confident that, you know, they've taken the right ethical position historically and let's see them do it again. Absolutely. All right, Avery, thank you so much, everyone. After the break, we'll be back with my amazing conversation with Nelly Mensa from LVMH. We'll see you soon. Consensus 2024, global crypto regulation, the disruptive power of AI, the rise of tokenization. Consensus is the one event where experts convene to talk about the ideas shaping our digital future. Join developers, investors, founders, brands, policymakers, and plenty more in Austin, Texas from May 29th through the 31st. The 10th annual consensus is curated by Coindesk to feature the industry's most sought after speakers and provide unparalleled networking opportunities and unforgettable experiences. Take 15% off registration with the code GENC15 Register now at consensus.coindesk.com, and I'll see you there. Want to get three years of access to Consensus with Microcosm's NFT? For just one ETH, you will gain entry to the conference and be eligible to receive randomized rewards, including gift cards to local Austin spots, a hotel stay, and VIP access to supercharge your event experience. In addition to three years of access to Consensus, you will also be the holder of a unique generative artwork, the Microcosms NFT, created by artist Bahad Karim. Mint now until March 14th at coindesk.com forward slash Consensus NFT. All right, welcome back to Gen C. Very excited to talk with both friend, admirer, I'm the admirer, and sort of confidant in this space, Nelly Mensa from LVMH. Uh, we've been trying to get Nelly on the show. I feel like it's been six months already. Uh, so thank you for making the time to to be with us. I would love, Nelly, if you could just start on like, what is your remit at LVMH? I know you have a lot of innovation in your background. Just tell us a little bit about who you are. It's great to be here. The admiration is mutual, Sam. And we finally made it. 
But overall at LVMH, I have the great privilege of looking after a whole range of innovation topics. So I oversee innovation for the North America region broadly. So be it Gen AI, innovation culture events. So we host innovation summits for our Maisons, educate them on different topics, but specifically on the topics of Web3, Metaverse, and Immersive, that is my remit globally. And so because of that, I do get to spend my time between the US and all of our headquarters in Europe, again, talking about things like the Aura blockchain, NFTs, metaverse platforms, gaming, and all the things that come along with it. For example, 3D content, uh, applications of Web3, besides kind of the typical ones. And it's honestly, it's a great gig. Can't complain. One of the things that, that's really interesting about what you just said was the fact that you get to go to all these different houses, all the sub brands, talk about these technologies. I'm just wondering whether it's sort of game engines, whether it's blockchain, whether it's the Aura blockchain specifically, provenance, what is the thing that sort of gets them most excited when you are having those conversations? Yeah, I think there's a couple of things. First of all, oftentimes the teams and those brands are so focused on the day to day, keeping their e-commerce website up, managing their, their media spend. And so very often they don't know exactly what, what is going on and what is the cutting edge. So they just love learning kind of the art of the possible. The other thing that they love hearing about is how similar industries are playing in the space. So for example, we love catching up with people like Sam at Coachella, the team at Nike, at Starbucks to learn how they're implementing the technology to see what we can learn. And thirdly, they just love brainstorming about how Web3 could possibly help their brands. What is the overlap? And so we have amazing conversations trying to figure out, you know, what's possible, what's realistic, what do we do today to set us up for the future? That's fascinating. And, and I think just to give a hat tip, I mean, the sort of suite of companies within LVMH that are working in this space feels like the most, certainly the most robust in the luxury space. But in general, I think whether it's Sephora, whether it's Louis Vuitton itself, whether it's what you've done, you've done across a variety of LVMH brands from wine to others. I mean, there is a lot of trial there. So I think it, it seems like they're receiving that message pretty well. Is that correct? Yeah, absolutely. And because there's such a huge range of what we call divisions, each one gets to experiment with different technologies and then pass on their learnings to the rest of the group. So, for example, in Wines and Spirits, we had Hennessy jumping onto Block Bar very early. And I think they were the very first NFT on an NFT marketplace. On the other hand, the beauty divisions are doing really well in the gaming space and are killing it in Roblox. And so they're making it more approachable for other brands to then figure out how do I actually build out an experience on a metaverse platform. So when you talk about Web3, are you including those immersive worlds as part of the Web3 kind of category of technology? Yes, we are. I mean, I think we define Web3 as the next evolution of the internet. So that does include the foundation of blockchain for digital ownership and transparency. But then there is the immersive world for how you experience brands, products, each other. And then even Gen AI comes into play because that's how a lot of those experiences are created now, but also tracked and optimized. What got you into this? I mean, I think about this through the, through the lens of you have a background which is really rich in digital strategy and customer experience. You've done a ton of retail. How did Nelly decide, I want to jump down this very nerdy tech road and get interested in not just the Web3 stuff, but you I mean, you're also deep in gaming. Like, like what, what was your, your character arc that got you here? I have been a nerd, honestly, from the very beginning. I will say that for the longest time, I wanted to be a doctor because most, both of my parents are doctors and most of my aunts are actually in medicine. But weirdly enough, my one thing that got me into the space was art. So I remember I was growing up in Russia at the time. I went to my friend's place for her birthday party and she had a PC that had Microsoft Paint and Coral Draw on it. And I remember like painting a little spray paint tree being like, oh my God, this is amazing. I just want to spend the rest of my time in front of the computer creating stuff. And it was also my intro to programming. We were using QBasic to do procedural, very early days of generative art, playing around with colors, shapes, and positions. And I realized that with just a few lines, you can create really complicated shapes. And so that's when my love affair with anything engineering and computers began. And I just followed that all the way through. 
So in undergrad, I had a job as a 3D modeler and a VR developer at the Stanford VR lab. I also ended up listening in on Dan Bonet's cryptography class. And so that was way back, you know, in 2005. And so when kind of Bitcoin and blockchain exploded into the public consciousness around 2013, uh, I knew that I really wanted to explore where that was going. One, because I was a big proponent of digital art. And so that use case immediately made sense of how can you certify that a piece of digital content is unique and how do you make sure that people producing it have uh, a livelihood. And two, again, I grew up internationally between Russia and Ghana. And I remember how challenging it was to have access, one, to banking locally, but also internationally, whether it was my parents trying to send me money while I was in school or vice versa, it was almost impossible. So again, like this idea of international transaction, banking the unbanked immediately resonated. And so I knew I had to get involved in that space straight away. I think there's so much to pull apart every time we speak. And now it's been numerous times. There's like, there's some other layer that comes out <laughs> in your background that I'm like, I'm like, she did that, you know, and even just like growing up in Russia and then back and forth there to Ghana was something we, I, I think last time we, we met, you we were talking about, I guess one thing that, that also makes me interested is a brand like LVMH, you know, I think about you being there. I also think about the fact that, you know, whether it's you or Benoit or that Ian Rogers came out of there yeah. also. And like, it seems like LVMH also does a great job of looking for talent that understands technology as a core way we have to brand build in the future. Um, yeah. Is that like, what is it about the DNA of the brand itself or the, I guess, the collection of brands itself that let, that attracts it to creative marketers like yourself? I think L LVMH, first of all, has always been synonymous with innovation but it's not always in the typical digital innovation way that we think. So if you look at all of our maisons, there's always something unique that they pioneered that has become kind of the core of that maison. So for example, the lock that you see on the LV trunks and that unique pattern, that was an innovation that was created by the MLITA. The, a very specific method of um, you know, making champagne, the riddling table that was developed by Vauve Clicquot. So there's always been this idea of trying something new to make exceptional products. And so then again, when digital became a thing that, you know, all brands and businesses had to do, that spirit of innovation followed it. And I think very often, in addition to wanting to be innovators, I think a lot of creative people love the adjacency between LVMH, creativity, the art world and this idea of belonging to something more elevated and dreamlike. And so I find that all of my colleagues are so multifaceted because they're connectors between the world of creativity, of art, of business and of tech. It's interesting because even on, even on the way in to my office today to, to record this, I was on the train and I was thinking about this and what I wanted to talk to you about. And, and I always sort of default to alliteration. But I, I was thinking that, that a lot of where we're at now when we think of emerging tech is yeah. this intersection of commerce, code, and culture, right? And those circles, and those circles get bigger or smaller, right? Some people look at NFTs and they're like, the culture side is a little bit smaller right now, whereas the commerce might be bigger, right? On the gaming, gaming is much more like commerce and, and culture, and I guess code as well. I mean, I guess I think about it through that, through that lens. And it makes me just think that modern brands in general who don't understand that that is a tension that you have to play, have to be involved in thinking about managing all, of the, all, th all three of the circles in the Venn diagram. Right. Whereas I do think for crypto, when we talked about crypto for too long, it was commerce and code, but it didn't have a ton of culture. The like religion behind Bitcoin is is almost over like ideological. Right. Exactly. Yeah, it is. It, whereas I do think when you say, hey, Louis Vuitton's here or you say Nike's here. Right. Or, or you think about Puma. I mean, just these brands that have rich histories of people who just love them, that I think it starts to recognize that we see that that culture opportunity is there. And people want to play in these spaces and they want to be seen as innovative and cutting edge. So where, where I want to go for you is, you know, is it because you guys look at NFTs or blockchains as luxury assets? Is it because you actually want to just deepen your relationship with customers and you think that these tools are the ones that get you closer to that? You know, what do you, what do you think the attraction is between this type of technology and your type of audience? That is a great question. Uh, and I do agree, culture drives everything. It's why the brands are so successful. 
uh, the Maisons really understand the importance of creating cultural moments, and they do that every day. And I think the affinity towards the tech is uh, a couple of things. One, it's a new technology that is absolutely worth exploring. Two, there are some use cases that are already very apparent. Uh, so specifically, you know, LVMH is the founding member of the Aura blockchain. That's been around for a really long time. Before, you know, even NFTs exploded, this idea of um, traceability, track and trace and authentication already made so much sense for luxury goods. But the other thing is we are looking forward to the day when we don't have to talk about the technology. The idea is for it to disappear behind the scenes and to try and figure out how can we use this tech to continue adding value to the clients, to make the interactions with the Maisons more special and to, again, basically take what we do day to day, which is produce amazing products, put them in beautiful stores, have incredible runway shows, but knowing full well that so much of how people experience the world is through digital channels, we have to be in those channels, but still in a way that's true to our DNA. So one, just again, you guys have been so early on a lot of this stuff. So just want to give respect to the fact of it. It's not a coming in for the press release moment for you guys, which I think a lot of people you know, I keep thinking of like, like that Taco Bell NFT drop that happened in 2020, where it's like it got a ton of press hits and then we've never heard from Taco Bell again, which is also OK. But then I think about the people who, who are continually building and I think building because I think, as you as you just said, using the Aura blockchain, provenance is so inherent in the luxury industry. You want to know that your bag is authentic. You want to know that your wine is a real bottle of wine uh, from the creator. So those things solve a business problem unlike the hype culture of just, are we doing a drop and is it making money? What are you seeing and what is the, what, what's exciting for you in the gaming space then? There, there is a lot there. I think gaming is becoming this new platform where the next generation is interacting with each other. Uh, it's not just gaming anymore. There is the social, the social network aspect of it. There is the ability to express yourself. So we talk about digital identity and gaming is kind of like one of the few places where you still have this idea of digital identity, meaning you, you know, a lot of gamers, I you know, was a very avid gamer, uh, <laughs> paused for a little bit because if I go back, you know, work would get done. But how much time do people spend just designing their avatar and making sure that it looks the, the way they want it to look? I think that's a very important concept that's coming out of gaming. And then again, this idea of digital ownership. Gaming has shown us that people do value digital possessions. They're willing to spend thousands and thousands of dollars on it. Uh, and I think it's kind of, you know, getting people to understand what being in a digital space with your peers, with your digital identity can look like. And so because the next generation of consumers is growing up in these environments, it becomes very natural for them. And so, of course, they would expect, you know, the brands that they care about, you know, the things that they own in the physical world to translate into into that space. Um, I think that's very exciting. I think the other thing that's very exciting is when you think about gaming, there's so much you can do around engagement, storytelling and emotion. So one, it's a great way for brands to connect with a consumer. It could be like the very, the very first time someone is connected to Fenty Beauty was probably in Roblox because they had a four week activation there. But then if you also think about gaming as something that elicits human emotion, and I say this because I was a VR developer and a gamer, you can think about the possibilities beyond your end consumer. So if you think about things like training, Right. So training your client advisors on the history of a brand, training people on, uh, for example, like empathy and soft skills. I'm very fascinated by the potential of that tech there. And just to bring it sort of first full circle to today. Right. We're a month into the Apple Vision Pro experience and the was it the Quest 3 with, with Meta. Are you starting to think also or having to think about the idea of contextual and locative con commerce and how people in the future might be? in very much hybrid worlds, you know, you did, you did VR, so you know, understand the idea of that, of that spatial understanding. Do we think that brands need to start thinking about spatial commerce right now? Absolutely. And a lot of our brands are, I mean, one that started even with AR, right? A lot of brands do activations with filters and it's, it's similar. It's just a different form factor with these headsets. The question is what is going to be the reach and is the person who is buying these headsets, is it aligned to who is buying your brand? And I think as they 
you know, there's more traction, eventually those two worlds will overlap and we will have to absolutely be there. And again, to us, it's one of the reasons why even last year we announced the partnership with Epic Games and Unreal Engine. And the reason for that is to absolutely start figuring out how can we convey the detail, the craftsmanship of our physical products in the digital space. Uh, so starting at the highest fidelity, how do we create those, you know, 3D models and products? And then depending on what the channel is, whether it's Web AR, whether it's Unity and Apple Vision Pro, you're then able to have different versions of that present for your customers. But it's absolutely something that is really important to us. And then, of course, there's then there's that connection to digital product passport and having, you know, both the physical and the digital items, you know, connected together, whether it's via NFC, RFID, QR code, both registered on the blockchain. All of those technologies really come together quite nicely for us. I keep thinking about the fact that the people who design very high end retail and really understand the idea of hospitality are utilizing toolkits today that are very easily translatable into AR, MR and, and VR, but we still have not seen a great use case of that, where the idea of being able to come into store or I can bring the store into my home or into a headset, it feels like that's like almost there, but the use case isn't right. But I keep thinking about the, like my nephew who's in his teens and like he spends more time in virtual spaces than he does in real spaces. So like it's a natural place for him to go, I think, in the future. And, and, and I think the trick here is to really kind of rely on an old school human centered design approach and really think about the client journey. So prior to my current role at LVMH, I spent five years at Sephora in San Francisco heading up innovation there. And we always talk about this example of how uh, Sephora Virtual Artist was developed, which is, you know, way back in the day, very early use case of augmented reality for makeup try on. Uh, the idea was always try and figure out what is the journey of a consumer uh, in store. And, you know, the reality was when someone goes into a store and they're trying on lipstick, you know, after two, three, four shades, you're actually, you're kind of done. Uh, and so what augmented reality allowed you to do is just very quickly go through a ton of different shades super fast. And so it was understood that the use case was there. And so then Sephora waited for a really long time for the tech to start looking realistic enough and not gimmicky. And then they turned it on for just lipstick. So again, because they kind of put themselves into the mindset of the consumer, they knew that that, you know, that would really work. But then the other thing that happened was as we were thinking about where this technology could live, we ended up putting the same Sephora virtual artist on iPads in stores. Because when you're shopping for beauty, you actually, you know, we say it's a two handed sport. You're holding your bag, you're on the phone with your girlfriends, you're swatching everything. You're actually not using your phone to also then interact with the environment. Uh, you're doing other things on it. Maybe you're playing music, maybe you're looking up reviews. So there's no point in forcing the user to do something. So then Sephora kind of went in two directions. One is there were iPads in store that automatically threw a look on you when you engaged with it. So then the client didn't actually have to do anything. And then the other thing was put the technology in the hand of the beauty advisors. So the store associates that were working there. So the tech is there, but it's not for the client, it's for the beauty advisor who then have all of this information, all of these AI recommended products. And so they're the ones who are able to then talk to the client and they're the ones that are empowered by the tech. Mm. I keep wondering about it, the, the idea, like digital fashion, I think still is really interesting, but I don't know the there there other than the fact that there's been billions of dollars in cosmetic sales in game for people who want to wear things yeah. or drive and skin their cars, that kind of stuff. But I keep thinking about it, you know, and, and you remind me of this of you know, the ability to sort of like customize your shade for your avatar on your character. And then if you could physically then purchase it, because now it's something you made through a, a Sephora. You know, even the people who are designing digital fashion often are, are designing fashion that isn't makeable in the real world because they don't have the constraints of things like gravity or, or whatever, you know, material design. But I almost wonder if like the pipeline should be, no, we're, we're utilizing game engine technology, which is so good now as a test pattern to say, what would we actually make in the real world? And, and thinking through that funnel of people who love the idea of gaming culture and they would like to wear it. And I think that's already happening. I mean, we're seeing a slew of young designers coming in being digitally native. So they are designing in close 3D browseware. There's all these tools that then, you know, very naturally the output of it can go into a gaming engine. Uh, but I think the question that you're trying to ask um, that's evading us is, 
the reason why digital only fashion is still pretty niche is we don't have enough spaces in the digital world to show it off, right? The reason why people want to buy beautiful clothes is because they have places to go, you know, like happy hour, some dinner, uh, versus in the digital space, it is either in game or as a social media artifact. And I think that's why we see a lot of success uh, of digital fashion by, you know, by dress X, Fabricant, um, you know, this outfit doesn't exist and drop. It works really well if your focus is to kind of convey like your sense of taste uh, and aesthetic on social media. But then again, you're not really able to wear it in the physical world. And as humans, we're still mainly uh, physical creatures who want to be in a cool place and want to look good and want to be recognized and want to interact with each other. And so I think as we have more and more avenues in the digital space to flex, quote unquote, we'll, we'll start seeing kind of a huge, um, you know, rise in people just wanting to have looks for their digital persona, but we're not there yet. Yeah, I think, I, I mean, we're not, and I agree. I think it's also that we still ascribe different value to these things, right? So when I first got to Coindesk, one of the things I started to look into, and it was, I wanted to do a column, which was basically a complete ripoff of the 36 hours column for, from New York Times Travel, and where I was just doing 36 minutes in virtual world. And I, but I was writing them then reviews as if I was a travel journalist, not as if I was a gamer. That's cool. Right. I do that. <laughs> right? And then I, and then I think about the, the guy on TikTok who does the people's gallery and he's like, what are you wearing? And like, tell us yeah. your story. And like that translates very well, I think, if you're in Fortnite. But no one like is doing content like that that starts to make it feel like, oh, I like I want to dress for the casual, not for the functional when it comes to my game experience. And and I think we're just not yet there in the in game worlds, but like it's coming. For for Gen Z and for the younger generation, they spend so much money in these worlds very specifically looking for items that they want. That they represent their identity. Yeah, often. exactly. For them, it, for them, it makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Now, two questions before we wrap. The first is, I know you and LVMH were kind of big players in NFT Paris that just happened last week. I would love to for you to just like give us the like two minute, what did both you speak on and, and how did you guys generally show up at the event and how was it received? Uh, I think it was received really well. We had actually quite a few uh, panels and opportunities to share our work. So I had a lovely conversation with Nick on business of fashion, and we talked about the paradoxes between Web3 and luxury, of which there, there are quite a mm -hmm. few, like this tension between a tastemaker and democratization, loyalty versus exclusivity, you know, access versus exclusivity. It was a really great chat. We also had the opportunity to see Agnès Visu from Louis Vuitton in conversation with Megan Kaspar talk about the Louis Vuitton trunk project. We had the team at Sephora who just announced Sephora Universe, which is a great experience. And they showed a teaser of that and also co-hosted a wonderful gala with World of Women. So that was a blast. And then we also had a panel on Aura Blockchain talking about the importance of digital product passport and digital twin, which we touched on earlier. So I think overall, it was just a, a really great event. And also, I love the amount of digital art that was present too. Uh, that's always something that is uh, very enjoyable and refreshing to see well you're an artist yourself so i get that and i think like you like you can't have a big event in paris that's not touching on these things and not have you guys involved whether it's the olympics which is coming later this year or it's uh, nft paris so i think it makes sense um i guess my final question you touched on it very briefly earlier was um you just sort of t spoke about how gen ai is starting to play a little bit in your yeah. your consideration set of how to talk to the maisons so when you think of just future innovation is that where your focus is going right now or are there things even beyond gen ai that starting are starting to sort of prickle your mind of these are areas that we should be exploring i think gen ai is definitely a big one and i think as much as it is capturing people's attention. What is great about it is you don't need a head of Gen AI because every team already kind of instinctively knows what they want to do with it, kind of their use cases, opportunities. So we're starting to see experimentation just across the board. And I think in terms of future tech, one, obviously we're very fascinated by spatial computing because we want to see where hardware will go. And so I think this idea of hardware is actually a really important one because it's not just personal headsets. It's also things like 
transparent screens, holograms, you know, this idea that if you want to interact with augmented content, it doesn't have to be by your phone or your headset. It could be, uh, you know, a screen, a mirror, a device that lives in the store. So the evolution of hardware is really interesting to me. And then the second one is IOT or the link between the physical and the digital. So besides NFC chips, we're starting to see really interesting technologies that actually let you connect some digital content or data to a physical product. So I'm really curious about how those technologies evolve as well. Both super fascinating. Nelly, thank you for giving us so much time. Uh, we really appreciate that you, that you came on. It was great to see you as always. And I'm glad we finally got to do this. We will see you soon. Gen C, thank you for listening and we'll see you next week. Bye.